nice. <laughs> I can go on Kyocon now and then have ChatGPT run the company for a day. I was going to say, that's every CEO with a, a hands-on board stream. It's like, see, the robot approved it. And it wasn't just me. Get to it, do it fast. Right here. On the Innycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here. On the Innycast. All right, welcome, everybody. I am really excited. Got a great episode today. We have somebody who has become extremely uh, critical to my life, both in business and personally. Uh, good friend. Uh, great service provider, better human being, currently fasting, so he's likely to say something uh, really, really that he shouldn't, which is great for us. Uh, Mehmet Tachin, here today, Mehmet. For those who don't know who you are, what Eduno is, what's your backstory? Hi, everyone. Backstory is basically moving to Latin America when I was 19 years old, starting Puerto Rico and then living in different places, ending up working in IT business. I worked in ICANN, Microsoft, Yahoo, a little bit of SpaceX and did consulting with several good friends who gave me the opportunity. Then I saw some opportunity in Latin America where it is a developing market. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of enthusiasm for online gaming, for content, for other things. So I said, okay, well, I will make this my home. I recently moved to Miami about a year ago and now living here with my wife and two kids just trying to help companies who want to do business in Latin America in terms of delivering content, bare metal servers, cloud services, I've just help them, help them get it done and then move on to the next thing and help them focus on what matters for them. So I can speak as a customer and say that Eduno is a very valuable uh, business for me, but um, I mean, I know most of the story. I don't know that I know all the story. You worked for a lot of big companies for, for a while. Most people, certainly in our space, tend to be serial entrepreneurs. Um, what made you take the plunge? Was there something that, that jumped out to you in the market? Was it something you felt inside? Like, how did you, yeah, how'd you get into business for this, yourself? Uh, this, is a good, this is a good one, actually. So two different things happened. One, throughout my work life, you know, I was traveling a lot and eventually I find out that my uh, son has a heart condition. And then it really kind of struck me down and I was like, okay, you know, I need to deal with this. I can't travel as much. I can't, but I couldn't stop because, you know, when my boss says, hey, I need you in Taiwan, I need you in Dubai, I need you in London, I couldn't say no. Then I said, okay, well, the only way I can stop this if I'm my own boss. But I also had a, a, a eyesight issue myself, which made me have to go to Colombia uh, to, to seek a solution. It, the problem I have with my eyes is called keratoconus and Colombia is very advanced with their eye treatments. So I went there and I had to stay there two, three weeks and five, six times a year during the two year period. Then I noticed, I'm like, what is going on here? Why there is no local content? The internet is really fast. It's in the local network. And I noticed, all right, you know what? This could be an interesting business, fun. My first anchor customer, I think you were my first or second anchor customer. I don't exactly remember the count, but valuable customer, a reliable customer, of course, this is what it matters. We grew together a lot and try to build a team. I met with some people in Colombia who basically told me, hey, there is this opportunity to buy this company, you can build it up from there. But that's how everything started. It's just you know two separate health problems that created this opportunity for me that I just wanted to just be my own boss. So if I have to take the day off to be with my son, to be with my family, I could do that. It sounds like it was meant to be a little bit. Yes, yes, I think so. And I mean, you started uh probably at a really good time for not just LATAM itself but you know you had your feet under you before covid showed up a little bit but tell me take me back to when you first started what like who was your first hire what was the first position you My hired first for? hire was Diana I believe you have met with Diana or emailed exchanged with her uh, she was actually our general she's our general counsel still she was the, the wife of our co-founder, uh, Juan Alcazar, basically the person who came and told me as we met and became friends. He, the guy, you know, was just a person that I met on the street a couple of times and he was so nice. He was like helping me to go to hospital and like so, so welcoming. 
And he told me this idea, hey, Mehmet, you know, I want to get out of here, the business that I'm doing. I want to go work for, you know, some startup. I have this idea, but I don't have the money. I said, well, I have the money. You have the idea. Let's start something together. So we end up acquiring this company in Colombia called Reduno. And Diana was my first hire. Basically, she quit her job. Well-paying, stable job as the general counsel, second person in charge on a big ISP, actually, in Colombia called S3 Wireless. She quit and came working for us for pennies. But now I think she makes it a bit more than pennies. That's good. That's good. Um, so you mentioned that you had the, the money. Um, one of the things we've been talking about a little bit is bootstrapping versus venture capital versus debt funding. Like from your perspective, I mean, first question is, um, I guess, how, how did you fund Eduno? And second question is, is why that with all the options out there? Yeah, I had the money. Uh, but I wanted to use somebody else's money because they told me it's less risky that way, but it didn't go that way. You know, uh, I, Aaron Hughes, who's, you know, really well known CEO, founder of six connect, where I believe still chairman of many companies, but peering DB to be more specific and Lane Patterson. So I went to them and I went to three or four other people, including Jordan and yourself, you know, uh, I said, hey, guys, I have this great idea that could be a great business in Latin America. Would you like to invest? Actually, you know, several other guys. I'm going to mention this one because he he still to this day messaged me once a month, tell me he regrets so much. Dan, uh, the CEO of No IP. Anyway, so long story short, um, I, I went to this route mainly because I it's not because I didn't have the money. But if I got other people's money. To get the return, they would also invest in time coaching me, developing me. And that was the, the very first six months to one year where, you know, we tried to do many things, failed. We, be, we wanted to become a cloud provider. We wanted to become an enterprise storage and backup provider, failed. And then later I found the niche of a niche, you know, just, hey, I bring international companies to Latin America and give them local access, build local networks. And that's it. That's how everything started, uh, self-funded. Uh, you know, I, I started with Aaron and Lane, and later on, their lives have changed, their opportunities changed, uh, and then we parted ways, but in a very good terms, I actually still you know, involve Lane a little bit for some consulting stuff with us. Uh, but you know, I'm, uh, that's how everything started. I took a lot of loans, paid back. We don't all, you know, have a lot of loans right now that's waiting to be paid, but it's all, all self-made. And thanks to friends who supported us, you know, I must acknowledge here when I didn't have the money, Jordan, you know, sold me equipment without even telling me, you know, leaves me stuff, sold me stuff saying, okay, don't worry, man. You know, I know you're going to pay. Didn't ask me for credit. This is, this is how we were built is with the good relationships, you know? Sure. Tell me about a niche within a niche. I think that's an interesting concept. Yeah, so everybody is trying different things, trying to be somebody different. And, you know, Latin America is an interesting market. So you can look at this largest tier one providers are there. Of course, Lumen, Level 3, Telxius, Sparkle, all the guys are there. Everybody has a different strategy. I looked at what everybody is doing and I said, okay, Lumen is doing this. This is what they're doing good. And they are probably the ones that do most goods and least, least wrongs, okay? Um, and what's Telex is doing? What Sparkle is doing? What's Internex is doing? I said, okay, I want, I need to do something very different to be able to be different than them. And you know, nobody's building, nobody's investing in building net metro networks. You know, you're in a career neutral data center. You're there. You have a content. You want everybody to come and say, hey, come peer with me, come connect with me. I didn't. I don't do that. I go to a city. I find out, point out where the data centers of everybody is, and I go connect into them. I go build into them. And when they need, you know, when I need capacity, guess what? I am inside their data center. They bring me the connection right there. And then the last, last mile, you know, using smart optics, Fujitsu, the other DWDM providers, uh, you know, just build this network. And this is the niche of niche because nobody is doing that. Nobody is focusing on doing that. And I hope, you know, after this, this, Video gets like a one million watch, and nobody else come up with an idea and create an you know competitor. But competition is also good. You know, I like the fact that some companies are coming along, like Lumen. Now that they're they're different, Sirion is their name in Latin America. 
they are now more competitive, more aggressive, but also great partners with that. We are we are thankful to have those guys as a partner. Mm -hmm. Do you is that sort of metro build concept? Is that unique? Would you say to Ladam? Like, uh, I don't see people really doing that in other markets in North America. Let's say. I think that in North America, the 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 car carriers and the mindset is very advanced because carriers know they have to go to the content and get it to get the content in a career neutral data center. But Latin America to this date, if you ask me, what's the best data center, like most connected data center in Argentina? It's the one owned by a telco, Sirio. It's the most connected data center. So telcos don't want to go there. Sparkle don't want to go there. If they are there, they don't want to put the main equipment there. They say, okay, you come to me, you come to me. And then basically we became and became the web. That's why we call it Edge Uno, the single edge, the single company you need to be in LATAM to be in the edge. And Uno is both in Portuguese and Spanish means one. So uh, this is basically how we build it. Is it unique? It is pretty unique. The way that the business is. Other people tried it, but then they go ahead and try to sell IP transit to some ISPs. ISPs say, hey, you're peering with me. Why do I need to pay for this and all that? It's just like a, like a nice balance, okay? Nice uh, balance. But also, I believe that recent years, as you well know, the metro, especially from 40 to 80 kilometer barrier, and the new technologies that came in, the 400 keys, ZR optics and all that, this also changed the game. And I think we fast adopted this everywhere because it was really painful to go 70 kilometers, 60 kilometers and get like an 800 gigi without investing a lot and repeaters and all that. Now that's not the case. You know, you just get simple, cheap equipment for $100,000, $200,000. It used to be really expensive as well, you know? So I think these, these, these are the main factors that allowed us to go fast. And I mean, I, I get to experience uh, Latin America through you a little bit. Um, how much specifically in a way that's different from let's not necessarily the U S and Canada, but the rest of the world, it seems to me that relationships matter more there. It's, it's, less less times it seems to be about the business case and more times it seems to be about who's making the business case mm -hmm. that's very true i think this is very similar to middle east i've been exploring middle east a lot also it's all about the relationships uh, in places like korea i worked a lot in korea in the past as well relationship don't really matter you know it's just pay. Hey, this is the price list this is you commit this maybe five percent you can get discount you know if you drink enough soju but uh, in this case, uh, Latin America is very different. It's about how your relationship is, what you are doing for them. Are you competing or are you completely completing something that they need? Is Do they need you or do you need them? This is the question, right? It's very easy to work with a wholesale provider in Latin America. The biggest ones, they all peer for free, no problem, because you have what they want. They monetize what you have. But try to mm -hmm. work with a eyeball connectivity, it's not because they don't want to, okay? It's not because they see you as, oh, this guy is going to make money out of us. It's not fair. No, it's not that. It's just, it's a different mindset. It's like their way of thinking is, oh, it has to be a process. They need to come to our data center. They need to buy space. They need to buy remote hands. They need to buy equipment from us. Like, you know, there are some data centers that are trying to sell me Dell servers at a retail price. And it's like, or or some Cisco equipment, Juniper equipment as a retail price, you know, MSRP price. And I'm like, guys, this is like, if I buy at that price, I can never break even. But yes, relationships matter a lot. Do, do people buy at that price? I don't know. I guess so. I guess some people does. That's why they're offering. And that's why enterprises and big telcos. Well, if you're, if you're in like Mexico and if you need to connect to a specific ISP, that's like the incumbent there, you know. There is no other way. There is no other mm. way. You need to do what you need to do to get the connection. And, you know, sometimes you pay double the price of a space. Sometimes you pay double the price of a, you know, a remote hands. But, hey, it's just a business case, business case. Uh, but in, in, every, in every instance, I think the relationships matter. Without relationships, some places, you know, yeah. 
it, you know, I think Brazil, for example, is the closest to European and North America culture. You can peer not with the big guys, but in the United States, you can peer with also Comcast, you know, unless you pay AT&T, Comcast, Verizon. The big guys are the same in Brazil, yeah. but rest is very open peering. Whereas in Mexico, in Colombia, in, in Peru, it's different. It's different. Mm -hmm. There is no, like one of the largest ISPs, this is a real story, okay? One of the largest wireless providers, we had to go on a five-hour call teaching them how to set up BGP communities. That be, not BGP community, BGP peering, okay? So, I mean, just imagine the mindset. They're running million plus wireless users, yet they don't know in the IP team, they don't know how to do a BGP peering. So mindset is different. You said something interesting there about enterprise. And I've been realizing as somebody who's never been enterprisey, really dealt with enterprises, worked in an enterprise, it's, I'm blissfully unaware uh, for the most part of some of those situations. But um, somebody recently, I was talking to somebody about cloud recently, and they were like, because I was just looking at some of the economics of some of the things people do in the cloud. And, you know, as I'm sure when you look at those economics, I'm like, this, this doesn't make any sense. Like, how? Like, why would you do this? How do you think this is saving you money? Why is this better? And, you know, somebody said, you understand those people pay, you know, sticker price for Dell servers. And they pay sticker price for Juniper. And so, yes, the cloud is cheaper. Uh Right. Like if, if, if you're playing, paying that enterprise pricing for whatever reason, right, because you're trying to spend your budget or you're, you know, you're, you need to make sure you have the highest tier of platinum support from HP so that your boss's boss's boss is, is happy or whatever those criteria are that lead you down that road. You know, I, I am not, I'm, I don't deal with people who would pay, like you said, you know, list price for a Dell server yes. or a Juniper router. <clears throat> Um, but if those people exist, I can understand why the cloud would be much cheaper for them. Yes. Yes. Like it, it's almost a bit of a, it's almost like an arbitrage play for, for Amazon, right? It's like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll buy this thing that you, you pay a hundred cents on the dollar for. We'll buy it for three, sell it to you for 30. Everybody's happy. Um, but for the other people who are also paying maybe not three, but we're paying eight <laughs> cents on the dollar, buying it for 30 doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, yes, exactly. This is one of the most common things that we are getting requests nowadays in Latin America. It's the big trend. People move the cloud. You know, they first move the cloud in some cheap region like Virginia, which I think is the cheapest in there overall, or somewhere in you know United States. And they want to localize the, the cloud because the big giant company, just, you know, cloud company just showed up in Latin America. They get one month, two months, three months. Then I have a call 11 a.m. Friday night. The guy, the CEO is like almost crying. I was like, hey, it's like double of the money I make. I need to pay in the bills of Amazon. Help me get out of it by Monday. I'm like, all right, well, let's do it. <laughs> I got to get yeah. on a plane and go there on Saturday to do it, you know, but it's hard. You know, you can put the data there. I don't know if you ever see the data prices in Latin America is $125 per megabits per second. There you go. Your controversy, $125 yeah. per megabits per second is incredible. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, that is incredible, uh, at least in 2023, right? Like, I, from my perspective, um, like, to me, bandwidth is free. Not because it's actually free. I don't give him for but, free for the record, okay? So just uh, let's be very oh, clear. <laughs> but, so I used to pay, so my, my, uh, my first CDN purchase, um, I bought two, two megabits from Akamai in 1999 for our ad delivery. Mm -hmm. $1,995 a megabit. So today, people would like to buy from me for eight cents. So in the grand scheme of $1,995 a megabit, it's at zero. Right. Like if, if I plot that on a graph, yeah. it's so close to zero that it's not even a tick. Yes. Um, and so when I say it's free, I don't mean it's actually free. And the good news is the volume is way up. 
yeah. but like on a, a the unit cost um in the in what we think of as the grand time i think of as the grand time scale of the internet right like late 90s to now not very long in the grand scheme of you know human history or anything and depending on your industry not very long but for us that's yes. like the whole commercial internet yes um you know pricing has has gone down by started at $1,995 and it's gone down $1,994 and 92 cents. Um, like it's at zero. That's free. That's if you, if you went back to me in 1997 or 98 and said, this is how much bandwidth is going to be. I'm like, Oh, cool. Bandwidth is free. Um, so to see now, you know, somebody, somebody smarter than me once I steal the quote, I think it was from somebody from level three, actually. Uh, they were on an, uh, some sort of analyst call and they said, you know, discounting has to naturally decelerate as something approaches zero. I haven't really seen it decelerate. So I'm happy to hear that somebody's selling it for $125 a megabit again, because I've been telling people the last at least two years on the CDN side, just like, just so you know, I'm not asking you to do an 18 month contract because of the reasons you think I am. But there's a chance that month 19, you might pay more. Like we might have reached the point where now such a higher percentage of, of, of cost basis is space and power, which continually go up, yes. right? Like realistically in, 19, in, in 1999, that, that $2,000 a megabit I was paying Akamai, 1950 of it went to cover their bandwidth costs. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, today of the, of the eight cents, seven and a half goes to pay colo and power and cross connect exactly and, and exactly. people all that sort of stuff. people also people yeah um so it's like I'm, i remember there's this like image that i keep seeing all the time that's like a pie chart and it's like you know what i thought would make me successful and like 100 percent of it is hard work and then it's like what really makes me successful and it's like 10 percent sleep 20 percent diet 30 percent exercise you know 40 percent time off like it's all these all these things and i want to do one now for like what i thought running a cdn was and it was like 100 percent reselling bandwidth what running a cdn actually is reselling space power cross connects hardware people like bandwidth today bandwidth has nothing to do with you know building and running a cdn for the most part i agree um, but simply because it went from 2000 to zero yeah it's a race so, to the bottom it's at the bottom so where is it where, where more you can race anymore and I see that I agree with you, you know, like with COVID, the equipment prices went up, the delivery times, you know, the lead times, stocks are low, you know, not many people has ports, oh, good luck getting 400, 800 gigabit that you need from a provider, they don't have it anymore. You know, some mm -hmm. cables, submarine cables are also more complicated nowadays because telecom stopped building it instead, you know, companies like really big telecoms that don't want to sell build it or OTTs build it. So international capacity becoming more monopolized, one or two providers has it. And of course, you know, mm -hmm. when, when variety, when the competition disappears, what's going to happen next is that the prices are going to go up. I have seen it for the first time ever in uh, one of my rows between uh, Argentina and Chile. For the first time ever, the person sent me order form with 20% increase and he sit down and explained me and I couldn't say no. He didn't tell me, hey, you don't have to buy if you don't want to pay 20% more. But he was like, these are the reasons that we sold you pre-COVID for this price. COVID happened and now this is our cost basis. We are being transparent with you. We need to charge you 20% more. And I, I couldn't go and fight about it, you know? Yeah. So... Uh, these are the things happening. Yeah, I think I think there's going to be a there has to be a bounce back. I don't know if it bounces all the way up to $125 a megabit. Uh but there certainly has to be some bounce I would think in the next 2 to 3 years on the wholesale transit side because there's not a whole lot more room to cut. There's not that much more room like the, you know, the economies of scale you were talking about with new optics right? That optical yeah, is there, opportunity. Yeah. It's that's hit now. And it's probably a ways before we get the next, you know, 10 X bump. Yes. Um, like the, you know, the time before you can get four terabits on that same pair yeah. is going to be a bit. And while that's all happening, 
space, power, hardware, all those underlying cost factors that we don't necessarily think the about. Power cost is just up. crazy nowadays, you know? And yeah. like in Turkey, the power costs went up double, you know, in the data center. We are in the data center. I don't need to name the name, but you can look at Imperial DB to see where we are. Uh, you know, double the cost. And that today, government announced, hey, we are giving 25% off to everybody. Let's see if they're going to lower the cost. Starting April 1st, they're going to lower 25%. Let's see if they're going to lower it. But I understand, yeah. man. There's a lot of other things. Look, I give you an example. I was looking for some holidays to go the other day. When I find out, you know, Jordan was in Mexico. I was talking to him. He's like, hey, I'm in Mexico. I'm like, hey, I got to go to Mexico now. You know, I got to copy this guy. But it is incredible. It used to be that I could go to the same place oh. for 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 the the quarter of the there price. Are too, there are too many rich people in the world. I don't know. It's four times the price. Like I I'm going to the same hotel. I just like this hotel in Cabo San Lucas. I yeah. like go there, stay same time of the year, four days. Okay, if more than that, I'm a workaholic. I need to go back to work. It's four times the price in four years. I'm like, wow, what just happened? Is it the time of the yeah. year? No, it's not a, like a peak time or anything. It's like incredible. I think COVID took a lot of people who were very price sensitive to travel and experiences and made them incredibly elastic on that cost. Yeah. Because when when I was that, like for me, I didn't realize until it went away how much I needed travel, mm -hmm. right? Like in a in a vacuum, I'd be like, oh, I love traveling, right? Who doesn't love traveling? I love going on vacation. Who doesn't love going on vacation? I want to go to Mexico. Who doesn't want to go to Mexico? But like during COVID, I realized like the only reason I work is so that I can go to Mexico or so I can go on a trip or whatever. Like that's my, if I didn't want to travel and see more of the world, like that's my aspiration is like, you know, take take my f friends, right? Whoever that whoever that looks like. Let's do a big trip and go do something we've never done before all together in a place we've never been. If I don't have that, why am I even working? Yeah, exactly. Like, what's the point? I like so so f for other people, it might be for family or something else. But what I learned for me is like that travel part is the point, and there has to be a whole percentage of people just based on the economics that you're describing that have figured that out as well. And we'll go, well, I guess if that's the price, I guess I will pay it. And you would have thought that there was like some sort of cap on the people who could afford to pay the current prices for hotels. But the reality is there were so many people that have the money, but on principle or have their limits or whatever, would just say, I'm not paying them. Like I would never pay more than, you know, 300 night for that hotel, but take it away for three years. Okay, I'll pay a thousand a night for that. Okay. Yes, that's that's what I'm sure. talking about. It's like unbelievable. Four times, man. Four times. Yeah. Airfares are okay. You know, they went up a little bit, and I think they are kind of trickling down. They are fine, but like really, like hotel prices and you know anything that you want to do, like a, a, some activity, you want to go have some fun for a day. You know, get a sail with a boat. It's like it's unbelievable. But it, it's an interesting especially as it relates to the bandwidth conversation, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting effect because I'm not sure the, the laws of supply and demand changed, but the perception of what the demand is certainly changed, right? Yeah. Like uh, had these, again, I think it's a post COVID thing, right? But had hotels known five years ago that they could charge four times as much and be full, I'm sure they would have. I'm sure they would have. Uh, but they didn't and they couldn't. So something's changed. All right, Matt, I'm going to need to start to charge you four times from now on. Let's see if that works. <laughs> hey. Then it is free. Zero as times free is free, right? As long as the hotels drop by 4X, that's the same money. You're good. Um, You're good. But that's like the... And I think that's what's got to happen in the bandwidth market, right? It is uh, for some people, whether that vector is quality or accessibility or something um there there is going to be a bump on for somebody saying hey listen in order for us to keep doing what we were doing before the price is now here and that's what hotels would tell you whether it's true or not is another conversation but they can make that same case that you know your vendor on 
on uh, Argentina to Chile was making, right? Yeah. Which is, hey, listen, my labor costs did this. My food costs are now here. Uh, you know, our marketing costs are through the roof because everybody's, you know, trying to get the same guests and blah, 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 blah. So it, I, I, I don't think it's that different. But what is interesting to me is that it hasn't gone away yet. Right? Like it's, it's March, 2023. And I sort of had in mind that there'd be a lot of people that said, oh my God, after COVID, I am willing one time only to shell out that thousand dollars a night for that $300 a night hotel. Seems like people are willing to do it more than once because the demand doesn't seem to be going away. Yeah. I'm about to go to my first vacation since COVID with family. Mm -hmm. We, we, we live in Miami by the water. So you know, I can just walk the ocean if I want. So, you know, it's like, we don't, we are not crazy about the beach, but you know, uh, we go to Turkey a lot. That's also another thing. But I noticed one thing that transatlantic flights going from United States to Europe is unbelievable. It's just like, I'm like, okay, you know what? Forget it. I will just go coach. You know, I don't care. I'm not paying that 10 X, 10 X. The rule is 10 X now, but I'm noticing something. Starting June, the several airlines that I'm checking because I'm trying to bring my family over from Turkey to uh, Miami, the prices have dropped down so much now. It's unbelievable. Like Turkey to Miami is like two grand for a business class. Whereas Miami to Turkey is like, is, is unbelievable. It's like, you know, eight grand, no, nine grand. Because nobody wants to go to Miami in the summer. Probably. There is that. Yeah. There is that. But also the quality is dropping, Matt. That's another thing to mention. You go to a hotel, you know, it's one of those things I was going to say. First time when I said, when I paid $500 one night in a hotel, I remember that was like my, uh, I think that was my honeymoon, if I'm not mistaken. Or like after honeymoon, I went with my wife somewhere else. I couldn't sleep. I'm like, how did I pay that? Because, you know, I remember my first paycheck was like 800 bucks a month. So I paid you know, that, and it was in, insane. And now when I see a, the hotel that I want to go, it's 500. I'm like, wow, it's cheap. <laughs> oh, it's so cheap. Yeah. Well, what's wrong well, with this one, you know? You might be like me. I figured out in my brain, inflation stopped in like 2002. So like the price I believe things cost, not things that I buy all the time, but just like random things is way lower. Like I think a dishwasher costs $300. How much is a dish? I don't know. Having just bought a dishwasher, I can tell you it's more than $300. Oh, wow. um, I think a good hotel room in New York City is $210 a night. I can tell you a good a good uh, hotel room in New York City is $210 a night. But I think it was in like the early 2000s. Like I think I, I have these prices set on something. And in my mind, they just stayed there. And every time I run into one of those situations, I'm just like, what happened? How is this possible? And then I'm like, hold on, compound 10% you know, annual know. times Double from, it. you know, 2001. And it's like, oh yeah, okay. That's actually the same price. Yeah. Um, as long as you factor in a little inflation and a little bit of people trying to make more money. Um, but I find myself in that situation as well. Like I would, why would I pay that much for that hotel? I stayed in that hotel in 2006 for this price. Yeah. Our business is interesting like that too, because you have, you know, everything is going up, the prices of the equipment going up, the technology is changing, but the things that you buy, the things that you sell is always going down, you know, the price. Mm -hmm. But every year you have to, last year, Brazil had to, you know, give, you had to give every employee in Brazil 20% raise because the government say, hey, this is the inflation. You have to give it to everybody. 20%. Go, good luck going to a customer and saying, hey, you need to now pay me 20% more. No way. No way. So it's a challenge. Related, how do you find sourcing talent in those countries? Like what, what markets are you in? We are in Brazil, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, Guatemala, that was small, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, and uh, Costa Rica. Biggest team is in Brazil. So we have a different strategy. Uh, what we did is, first of all, rule number one, stay away from the big cities. If you want to do anything, 
in the in Latin America, you know, there are big mm -hmm. companies are doing this. So the, one of the big uh, big companies that we know in the same city as us, we are in a city called Uberlandia. It's in Minas Gerais, in the center of Brazil. When you look, it's very you know, eight hours drive from Sao Paulo, uh, in the in the state in the center. This is a farm town, except some of the top schools, technical schools. And a very large private company called Algar is a telecommunications company. And another company called Cargill, I think it's a US company, is based right there. So mm -hmm. what's our strategy? We go find the city, must be small, must have a good school. Why small? Because I can, by paying them a good price, bring people from big cities to do small city because everybody wants to kind of get out after COVID. They want to no longer deal with the traffic, going to the office. Of course, you know, we have a, I know you are 100% remote, I believe. We are 100% remote. We were 100% remote in COVID for one day. The rest of the time, we couldn't be because of the type yeah. of the work we do. How can I be remote if I have to be in data center, do the physical work? You know, my knock needs sure. to be in one place. But this is our strategy. Go find a small city where people want to live. Uberlandia is number one city or number two city in whole Brazil in the living quality, safety, living quality. So what we did is we went to this place. We established some relationship, good relationship with the schools. Actually, we had some students coming up uh, yesterday. These are the fourth year students, fifth year students ready to graduate. We get them when they are young and then invest in them two years, three years with no expectation, right? We expect that mm -hmm. they are going to be with us five year, 10 year. And our idea is to invest and teach them. Some people that we find, for example, is like the chess champion of Brazil works for us in our knock. You know, she's a brilliant girl, very smart girl. When a problem happens, the way that she's thinking and solving problems are very interesting. Finding these people is very hard. English is the mm. easiest part, okay? Just for the record. For for a lot of, of my friends, they say, but how do they speak English? I'm, English speaking is the easiest part. The hardest part is to teaching them what they need to know in, you know, the, the training them and taking time because it's it's young people. So, you know, you're we are hiring youngest people we have in the team is now, this is legally allowed, by the way, it's 16 years old, mm. 16 years old. Apprentice, we call this, you know, in, in Brazil, when you have 35 employees or 30 employees, you have to have some, uh, you know, apprentice that will come and try to learn the job. And I think my CTO, Epaphras, whom you met, um, he, was also, he was also apprentice in, in a telecom company, ended up being the CTO. So long story short, uh, this is what we do with Brazil. Brazil is also work-wise, there's a lot of European, there are a lot of German and Japanese uh, influence there. So work-wise, quality of work, the output is, is really strong. Engineering, work ethics. This is all across the Latin America. It's, it's like you can really find the hardworking people. But specifically yeah. in Brazil, engineering seems to be a little bit more advanced. Uh, we are now trying to grow in Ecuador. I find, so engineering for me, Brazil, administrative things, legal, project management. I'm sure, you know, give it, give it a shout out to your favorite project manager. <laughs> from Argentina or Colombia, you know, those are great places. For example, security team wise, no matter where you go in the world, the best security guy seems to come from Argentina. You know, mm. interesting, right? Because this is where I think the, the life, the way that they are growing up, the paranoia and stuff like that, they are just becoming interesting, very strong, very powerful finance people. For example, Peru, Colombia, Chile, we find really strong people that are in the finance. Sales is the same way, Colombia. For some reason, we are finding these people that are like different. But if it's not the same luck for me to find the same level of engineers, for example, in Colombia, I can't find a network engineer that knows that. So I, this is actually stats. There's like two person in whole Colombia with GNCIE. Two person. I, I know you don't care yeah. you know, the, the certification and all that. But we were looking yeah. for that. There is like more than 100 person with GNCIE in a similar population place. I'm comparing apples to apples, right? In Chile, you know, it's very different yeah. culture. So yeah, this is this is where we are focusing on. We don't have anything outside of Americas except sales. We have a sales and a data center engineering in Europe and that's it.
So those young people you're getting out of school, do you find them, like you, I know you said you have to train them. Do you find them coming out of school prepared, not prepared? Where are they on the continuum of, they, of where they, they need to be? Yeah. Uh, in most of the time, these are like these specially higher type of dudes that now like that have streamed on Twitch before that likes to play online gaming. They have some high ranking in Counter Strike. Some of them, you know, we are looking for especially people that are like that. Remember, this is a school with 100 students in that year to graduate. We hire four or five. Some years we can't find enough people between two schools, mm -hmm. three schools, and this is every year we are trying to do it. Uh, they are not ready. They're very disconnected. You know, uh, they don't understand the technology. They don't understand what is about. But hey, remember, you're still young. I'm still young. You know, 20 years ago, what did we know about the internet? You know, what did we know about anything? 21 years old, if you told me, I knew ping, I knew trace route, but you know, I, I remember now, you know, the questions I was asking, I was an IRC administrator. I was trying to link a server from Switzerland to Paris because the Paris server was like the route server for undernet. And there was a latency was bad because the route was going through Frankfurt and Paris. And I was asking the Pascal Glor, he was the, he's, he was a CTO, he's a CTO of Swisscom or one of the Swiss uh, ISPs, big Swiss ISPs now, good friend of mine. I was asking, hey man, just configure something, do something and fix it. He's like, man, man there's no fiber going, you know, like I didn't understand it. So I don't blame the kids. But yeah. one thing I can say, Matt, they are very hungry. They're very hungry mm -hmm. when we sit down and, you know, when we teach them about our customer, we tell them, look, this guy in the middle of nowhere that is relying on this low orbit satellite connectivity it's relying on us so what you do what you answer that the speed that you answer speed that you solve a problem it really matters because that person might be calling their daughter might be having an emergency that trying to do or in the middle of a doctor appointment or just simply just you know on a conference call i think when you explain young people the mission it's very easy to motivate them at least for me, for my company, I'm lucky I'm in a business that it's very motivating, you know? Uh, it yeah. might be different for different business. Do you think that would have been true as true five years ago? Like, do you th I don't is there think a, so, no. Is there a change? No, I think 10 years ago, definitely not. Five years ago, I think it would be true, but like 10 years ago, because the power of social media, you know, when a young kid comes and tells me, hey, so what do, what do you do, you know? I don't go and tell them, hey, we give services, data center, colocation. I'm like, I'm like, give me your phone. I tell them, hey, launch this app, this famous social media app, launch this streaming app, launch this game. Okay, now you're using a Juno's infrastructure. This is what I do. And it's simple for them. They understand the importance of it. Before, mm -hmm. you know, the penetration of the smart smartphones and the 5G, 4G, 3G, you know, Wi-Fi, it was not, it wouldn't be easy to explain like. Because this is now a real case, you know, real life scenario. You say, hey, we do this. So you're going to yeah. be part of this. And they are like, wow, I really, it's really cool. I want to be part of it. The reason I ask is I'm, I think it's dangerous today to tell somebody who's in school, especially today, especially, and try not to talk about too much current news on these to date them, but like, especially in an, you know, open AI world you know i look at somebody's resume and you know they said hey you know for the past four years i've been getting two-year-old information and i'm like so you're eight years behind what's what's actually happening and and to me that strikes me as the difference between you know you and i and irc 20 years ago we were fiddling we are in slack now this was a difference and you know? we're, yeah the world, <laughs> look, look how far we've come now 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 we're in slack channels instead of irc channels um we were doers, right? There was no course, right? There was no like learn how the internet works course in 2001. No. We were figuring out how the internet was going to work. Um, and I, and I think that's hard to tell people that, you know, the path is you go through school, whatever that is, two years, four years, the curriculum, just by definition of the fact that it's curriculum is so out of date. It is. 
I was talking and, to my uh, son about this. Sorry to interrupt you. I told no, him you're no. probably going to end up being a farmer because by the time that you go to college and finish a college, every information will be based on you know AI, Chat GPT, yeah. and other AI platforms. That is, you you're not going to be needed. You can be much happier going and farming something and raising some cows or something. And at least you know that that job is stable because, you know, people will need food. People will need food until until AI, you know, builds a better fake Soylent product thing. I'm not eating Soylent. You know my steak no. choices. I don't need to tell you about that. True, we have had some true. good steak in Chicago. Yes. That's why I like to ask people that especially that are recruiting people out of school is, you know, how much is, how much is unlearning, right? Like, and how much is teaching them new skills that didn't exist and how much is saying the way you were taught, you know, pick, pick your does not scale, uh, or does not work or is not the way you do that. Or like, I, I, I haven't yet found somebody out of school where I was like, guys, let's copy what was in the textbook that this person learned from that we oh didn't. My God. It's yeah. just so, I, I, but again, going back, maybe that works in the enterprise. But though, you say right? there like is maybe. a two year gap, you know, you, you say there's a two year gap, but I believe yeah. the gap is closing in the teaching. So when I went to college and I went to one of the best schools, you know, in, in Puerto Rico, and they were like proud of being the most advanced, you know, the best, the first uh, company that first school that went bring internet to Puerto Rico and all that pioneers of internet too there. Fantastic, right? But schools, I was still learning like basic and Pascal and like, like really, really old programming. This is 2005. I mean, okay, yeah. maybe, maybe there wasn't much, to, much to show. And four years ago, I don't know if you remember, I, I did my MBA. Uh, my, my master's in Columbia University, it was more up to date, especially the things that I focused. It was more like, okay, you know, two years ago, you know, the studies of the cases that I was studying for the business side of things. It was like, hey, just this case that in 2020, 2000, you know, like nine, 2010, rather than 1995. Of course, there were some specific cases they got in law from many years ago, but I think it's catching up. What I think is about to happen. So I was talking to my wife, you know, my, my son has applied some private schools and he didn't get accepted because he didn't have good grades last year. You know, hopefully by the time he, he watches this next year or something that, you know, he gets in a better school. But everything is changing, Matt. It's unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable. They did the test that my son took. So my son took this test and he scored like 84 mm -hmm. after killing himself. For one year, imagine, they put the same test called SAT. I don't know if it is, no, SSAT, SSAT. Chat GPT version 3.5 scored 99. Yeah. How is that yeah. possible? Because it's memorization, like the, the because it's a standardized test. Yes. Uh, and there, I, I mean, honestly, I tried to, avoid as much of the AI hype as I can, which seems to be less and less than I can avoid every yeah. day. But in 10 years, the information still, again, there'll be evolution, but like they're all just language models, which means somebody's still got to be preparing the data sets and the inputs. So not everybody can be doing farming <laughs> or else all we're going to be able to learn from chat GPT in 15 years is like, you know, what the best feed is for a certain type of livestock. Um, so, I mean, my concern would be that we, the people that it's going to put out of work today or the type of job that it's going to put out of work in the next five years is the job that it needed to bootstrap. And five years from now, I'm, and I'm not a futurist, so I'm sure a futurist has a much better answer than me, but I'm concerned that then it just creates a gap because it's going to drive people out of those professions that fed the data into it. And realistically, the reason it's really good is it has a lot of human generated content to consume. If we get in a position where because of it, humans start producing less and less content, it's going to get stupider and stupider yes. and stupider. Then it's going to be as boring. Time goes by. Right? It's going to be yeah, boring. like, well, it's just, it's not going to have a, a rich data set. If everybody who's building the data set says, oh, I can't be in the data set game anymore. I better go, you know, raise cattle or 
But I think so Google I, I will think... be really hurt with this. I have a feeling like this is going to really hurt Google in terms of, look, last couple of months, I tell you, in, to help with my kids' homework or just for me to search something, I stopped using Google. I use Google to go find a website that I can go, you know, mm. specific thing. But when I'm trying to search an answer, I don't go to Google anymore. I just write yeah. to chat GPT and it's interesting because it doesn't just give me an answer saying, okay, this is this. No, it almost like connects with you. And this is like very early version. I can't imagine maybe yeah. the next time you're having this conversation with chat GPT or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Anyway, you don't like chat this topic. GPT. Again. Per- pretend you're per- pretend you're doing a podcast with Matt and Mehmet. What, yeah. would, what would it say? Yeah. There it goes. Um, no, you're you're right. There is. Um, I found. I don't. I wouldn't say that I use it, but um, I definitely play with it. And I have found some very specific instances where if I ask the right question, it saved me twenty minutes on Google. Yeah. Right. Like it. It. You know, my Google routine would have been clicking like thirty things, making a quick note, trying to compare. You know, two different information sources. One might be right, one might be wrong. Um, and and I I can't remember what I, I was even looking at, but I was just like after ten minutes I was like, why don't I try ChatGPT for this? And it gave me like every answer I needed in three seconds. And I it honestly saved me twenty or thirty minutes, it, and not like a, you know oh plan the perfect you know vacation itinerary if I'm going to Cancun Mexico type question. It was like a you know what service provider it was like. I was trying. I know what I was doing. This is a very first world. I think there are only first world chat GPT problems, but um, I had a friend who was traveling and he was trying to get a a restaurant reservation. Couldn't get it. And he asked me, he's like, do any, do you have any access to concierge services that I might not to see if they have a relationship with this restaurant or whatever? And so I was like going through my credit cards, trying to figure out who was the concierge provider when you press I am one just for curious concierge. which restaurant is this that you guys are trying to get into? uh it was Ma- mama's fish house in maui okay uh, all right which apparently books up six months out yeah um incidentally i did get i did find him a table at a time that didn't work for him and but a cancellation opened i found him a cancellation and he declined it however uh i don't know john if you're ever gonna listen to this but if you are this is you um but i was so i was trying to find Okay, I've got this Visa, I've got this Amex, I've got this Mastercard. Who who do they use? And I'm googling and thising and thating and and it was a pain and conflicting information. Amex has insourced it. No, it's still outsourced. And I just asked Chat GPT and I was like, if I have a you know a Canadian American Express card, who provides the concierge services? Dude, it's these people. It's like, oh, okay. What about this Visa? Blah blah. Oh, it's these people. Uh, okay, Mastercard. Oh, it's the same as the first people. It's like great. So now I only have to make two phone calls instead of three. But the level of Googling that I had to be doing yeah. to find it, you know, was like, you know, Reddit asked me anything. It's like, I'm a concierge for American Express. Ask me the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like the, and I had to find all these weird rabbit hole things, you know, case studies from the concierge service explaining how they, you know, who they work for and stuff. And it was right. I, like I, when I called, I was like, by the way, you know, blink twice if you're actually working for so-and-so. And I, anyway, it was imp- I haven't been impressed by much AI or anything like that like my standard answer is always like you know i'm not really worried about computers taking over the world like right now every three out of ten tan three out of ten times i put my hands under a hair dryer or a hand dryer it recognizes them as hands and seven out of ten times it doesn't know what i'm doing so like listen if we can't get a a hand dryer in a bathroom to recognize hands we got a long way to go before i'm worried about you know the ai AI taking over the world but this was impressive yeah, for me, uh, you know, I'm a, I, I, I'm Turkish, born in Turkey, kind of raised in Latin America. English is my third language. I learned Spanish before I actually fourth language because I learned Turkish, then I learned Arabic. But I don't speak now too much, but I learned Arabic, then I learned Spanish, then I learn English. So now I communicate in the mm. fourth language. For me, sometimes it's very complicated to write things up. The talking is easy. But writing things up is very complicated because I have so many thoughts. Do I structure this sentence like a Turkish? Sometimes I just say things. I just like tell, hey, chat GPT, this is what I want to say. 
this is how I want to say, I want to say this emotionally with motivating this and that, draft me something. I love that. Mm. I love that, you know, amount of time that it saves me from drafting something, then I can edit it, make it perfect, make it more like me, not like a robot and send it yeah. out. I think this is the best way, best thing it does for me. And sometimes mm. I actually use yes, chat GPT as like, kind of like an assistant, like a person. I receive an email with some interesting proposal and, you know, I put the, I put the email as is and I say, hey, what do you think about this? Do you, do you, does this does this sound like a good deal? I am serious should about I, should this. I, should I do this? No, yeah. is this a good offer? I, Marlon, actually, your favorite PM, sent me a proposal saying like, hey, dude, we are going to get this swap and it's a great deal and all that. I, I didn't do the math. I just posted mm -hmm. there and Chat GPT say, according to the swap values and all that, this is a profitable deal for you. So it's a good deal. You should do it. I'm like, nice. <laughs> I can go on Cancun now. And then I have Chat GPT run the company for a day. I was going to say, that's that's every every CEO with a, a hands-on board's dream. It's like, see, the robot approved it. <laughs> and it wasn't just me. No, but I'm also, I'm also seeing now more and more communications become like, you know, I know somebody sending me a request with an AI bot, you know, in it, mm. it's becoming annoying. I just, you know, connect to my AI bot and have them reply each other all day long. Somebody's trying to sell you, you know, about those emails that say, Hey, Matt, good morning. It's been a long time since we talked. I'm like, I've never talked to you. What are you selling me? So, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the friction required to send a good cold email is going down. Oh, no. I never send right. a cold email. My, all my cold emails are specially carved. No, you know, AIs or anything. But you don't need to anymore, right? That's the thing, right? Like, chat GPT, you know, find Mehmet's hobbies and draft me an email that includes a reference to his hobbies. Let's do uh, it. Let's try that. <laughs> okay. Not, not but, that, but that's that's the, right? So So that's an example of it, like... You know, the cost the cost to sending a cold email used to be 30 minutes of research. Yes. If the cost of sending that same cold email is now 30 seconds. 15 seconds in chat yeah. GPT, the, I can tell you the volume is going to go up. Yes. Right? Mathematically. Yes. Um, so, okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, actually, let's go to the mailbag. We've got ma viewer questions for Mehmet. Uh, cue the music. All right. First up for Mehmet, also from Miami. Florida Panthers play-by-play -play announcer Steve Goldstein. Goldie, what do you have for Mehmet? So it's really exciting to have Edge Uno uh, headquarters in South Florida. You know, it makes so much sense with the accessibility and the synergy with Latin America. It's an easy trip to get back and forth and the culture. So uh, my question is, what was the most difficult? What was the biggest challenge as far as a country is concerned? Uh, the most challenging country to enter into in Latin America? Oh, Mexico. Mexico mm. is very challenging, very, very, very dangerous as well, you know, because of a lot of things happening there. If you're not from Mexico, this is one of the reasons mm. we are hiring a lot of resources there, trying to build a local team so we don't have to travel too much. I mean, I feel safe, you know, when I go there, I'm not a gringo. I'm, you know, I'm a Turkish guy. When they look at me and I speak Spanish, like I speak Spanish, Spanish, like a Latino, you know, with a strong Cuban yeah. accent and Puerto Rican accent. So they're like, oh, okay, where are you? And when I say I'm from Turkey, they give me a hug and they're like, whoa, you know, I love that soap opera of you guys. You know, you look like that guy. <laughs> but it's still challenging because of the mindset. Okay. Usually for my business, markets that do not have career neutral data centers established or they have career neutral data centers, but they have big incumbents. As you know, I, I'm pretty sure you know this Mexico market is split into four carriers, nothing else, okay? Total Play, Telmex, Easy, Mega Cable. They distribute, they they share the whole country. It's not like Brazil where there's 1,000 providers, small providers, not like United States, wireless. No, it's changing now. Mexico is also changing, but there are just no options. So basically, countries where I don't have options are the hardest ones. Easiest one for me is Colombia. And that's usually the hardest one. People are so scared doing business there. But actually, it's for me, I feel safer in Colombia than anywhere else, including Miami. Saudi Arabia is hard, very hard uh, these days. But, you know, out, that's outside of the Latin America. Globally, 
The hardest for yeah. me was Korea. Nothing is more harder than Korea because you don't start negotiating until at least you drink a half a bottle of soju. Uh, literally, right? They don't yeah. even talk about business. So mm. uh, it's very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, next question. Mehmet, what is the cloud? Cloud is somebody else's computer. I'm pretty sure somebody else answered that. For me, cloud is basically, as a user, do you want me to answer as a user or as a provider? I want you to answer as Mehmet. For me, I I used to run an infrastructure called, website called In Infrapedia. This is where you put a bunch of infrastructure information, allows you to find the best data center, best fiber connectivity, peering location, whatever. What is cloud? When I was building that product, I needed to have a web server. I needed to have a database server. I needed to have a CDN. For me, cloud is where I just launch my app and I don't have to worry what is underlying, what operating system there. This is cloud for me. For me, mm. an enabler. Cloud is an enabler. Cloud is what allows me to focus on what's important for me, which is my product. So Interesting. So I, I, what I heard there, which maybe we'll come back to, is you, you see cloud as the abstraction layer. For many companies, infrastructure is the abstraction layer and cloud is that thing that you pay and usually pay a lot mm -hmm. of money to not be bothered by so you can focus on the core business of you. For somebody that right. is not their core business, is cloud is a way to take all their IT needs resolved, you know, and then focus on the product side of things. Right. Okay. Uh, last question from the viewer mailbag. Related question, actually. Somebody somebody stole my question. Uh, this is interesting for you because it's actually in the name of your business, but this is, a, I think, always an interesting question. Where is the edge? Who are you? Who is asking? Because, Mis because miscellaneous, miscellaneous. No, no. Uh, but when I say who are you, not the person asking. Who is asking me the yeah. question? If you are a streaming company asking me that question, edge is different. Mm -hmm. If you are a sure. backup disaster company asking where the edge, edge is different. If you are a yeah. stock trader, then the edge is different. For me, depending on the job that you are in, depending on what matters for you, is it your famous line, right? Throughput or latency, which game we are playing yeah. in here. So if you are sure. focused on high throughput, it doesn't matter. If you're a streaming company, Edge can be yeah. in Sao Paulo. Let's talk about Brazil. In Sao Paulo, Edge is Sao pa In Brazil, Edge is Sao Paulo if you're a streaming company. You don't need streaming, yeah. not live streaming, streaming, Netflix, Disney. If you are a high-frequency trader, then it's very specific geographic location in Sao Paulo because that's where the trading happens. You can't move yeah. 10, 10 meters, 10, 10 kilometers away from it. You move your office right there in that building called B3 in order to have the lowest yeah. latency. That's where the edge is. Where do you see between those opportunities? Between those opportunities. Where is, yeah. where, where's, the, where's the biggest um, uplift potential yeah. I, for the edge? Yeah, I think that... so. The, first of all, in Latin America, there is still a lot of companies. This is sad, but the truth, you know, in our building, a new office building, I went through the neighbors and shake hands and all that. Still people host servers, physical servers in their, that, you know, in their offices. No, this is not like something to open their security cameras or anything like that. No, it's just real servers. Like other, the person hosts their mail server, web server there in the office. So first of all, Latin America is a couple of years behind in general. I don't want to say everybody is behind, but mostly a little bit behind. This is going to move the cloud, public cloud, centralized locations. And people will realize that, hey, this is not really fast enough. I need something faster. There is a big move now because of the security for remote desktops in Latin America. So some companies are actually giving people iPad or iPad-like mm -hmm. devices instead of giving computer and give a keyboard and mouse and have people remotely work or a very weak laptop, but keep everything on a remote desktop. So depending on which business you are in, depending on which field you are in, mm -hmm. edge is going to be not this is not immediately in Latin America, but in a 10 year time frame, edge data center will be a very sweet spot. 
where if something around 500 kilowatt to one megawatt data centers in multiple parts of the city, rather than one big giant data center of 50 megawatts in the middle of nowhere, because that's the only place that has that 50 megawatt power, I think is going to be more distributed. Let me ask you, do you go to big supermarkets these days? Like big ones? I don't know which ones are in Canada. Like Carrefour, I, that's a French one. I don't know if you guys have that. Yeah, not not really. Yeah. But if you go, if you have to ever go, maybe you go to Whole Foods, right? Sure. Yeah. This is, I think, the mindset, okay? Look, remember the Sam's Club, Costco times, you know? I don't go to Costco. I don't go to Sam's Club anymore. I'm a small family. I don't have that big needs to go and fill up everything. Maybe sometimes I get things, but all online gets delivered to me. I think it's the same thing with the data centers. Data centers are going to be more focused on, okay, consumer wants this. Maybe, you know, I have the patent for this as well. I was at Microsoft patenting, having an Xbox basically be in your CD and in your home, caching the movies. Mm -hmm. As you know, some devices already do that for the Netflix movies. They are pushing the games on the off-peak hours and things like that. I think Edge is going to really evolve in such way that users behave but in latin america we are still five to seven maybe ten years behind to that before that so there will yeah. they will build massive data centers 50 70 megawatts and later on bring them into cities different locations and this is what we do this is what we why we build the data center in bogota now we build another one in uh, we bought one in ecuador and our goal is to do the same thing in peru in argentina in chile to have this niche place right nearby the stock exchange our our data center is one kilometer away from the stock exchange of colombia so yeah uh it's an interesting thing so in a situation like that is the value is the value the network or is the value the colo no, the net the value is definitely network it's a, it's a data yeah. center a data center without a network is a warehouse it's always the, the but sure. also a reliable data center so right place right time right network mm -hmm. you know this is what it matters i think is there a country you think uh is next to or first depending on your perspective to break out with that sort of new take on data centers and chile because of chile. the geographic way you know it's a long country you can't put everything in santiago and after COVID, Chile was one of the countries that got really impacted bad. A lot of people moved out to countrysides, different sides of the Chile. And it's a you know, long country, a lot of earthquakes. I think instead of centralizing, there are more. And by the way, if you go to Chile, you will think like you're at somewhere in the middle of Asia or Europe because of the type of tall buildings and the cultural. Chile is very different. I think they're more advanced than, I believe, in some cases, uh, even than Brazil in Latin America. They are like the, the most advanced. And... That's why they are most of the time the most expensive place to go also in Latin America and to do business. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's do story time with Mehmet. Uh, give me two stories. You can choose the order. Uh, just in your business career. What was your worst day? What was your best day? I just messaged my wife saying that today was my worst day. That's joking because I told her I, yesterday was my worst day and she, to make me feel better. She made my favorite dessert. Okay. This is one time in a year. You know, I messaged her today. Hey, I, today is worse. What are you Sounds cooking? Like every day is yeah, the worst. Yeah. Day. She was like, Hey, what are you cooking today? And then she was like, Hey, I know you're taking me out tonight for dinner. Um, what was my worst day? Man, I remember this. Um, I was at the, I was a ceremony administrator for root DNS sex ceremonies. Back in ICANN days, I got food poisoning in the night before. I ate this. The event was in a small town in, in Virginia called Culpeper, Virginia. It's like crazy. A lot of people come in. We go out to dinner. And I was there for a whole week. So I took out the people to this restaurant. It's famous with its steak. But I ate steak there two times already. So I was like, I would eat everything but steak. So I got fish. But let me tell you something. You don't mm. eat fish in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. Okay. That's, that's the, that's the, yeah. that's the punchline. But I wake up. So all night long, I am so bad. Like I, I had to go and get like Pedialyte and I had to go to ER and get like, you know, uh, stuff because I'm constantly losing water. 
and I couldn't do the ceremony. So kudos to Joe Abley here. I don't know where he is these days, but he covered me. He was the backup at that event. So as a ceremony administrator, basically I'm in charge. I'm the root signing with the DNS seg. But man, I was yeah. like so bad. I felt so bad. I'm like, how could this happen to me? I'm like, but then I understand, okay, this is why the process has a backup first. But this was my yeah. worst day. So so for those, but I, I, I don't want to, I want to get you to the best day quickly, but for those who don't understand, if you didn't have a backup, yes, what what happens uh, in a in the DNSSEC world if that signing party doesn't happen? So that specific event was a regular. You know, I was signing the key signing key, so I was no oh, okay. no no sorry. I I own the, the the key signing key. I was signing the zone signing key. Verisign came in, so I signed with Verisign. Gave we validated we part ways. First of all, it's a yeah. it's a disaster for people who travel there because it's it's a nightmare to bring people from the different parts of the world to do this ceremony. It's very transparent live stream, and of course, you know, you do this. At, you know, six months in advance. So nothing emergency would happen. But if this happened in the event that we were creating this, the the key, yeah. oh, we travel, we we train that for two years and practice. It would it would be tough. It would be tough. Yeah. So in this case, people just would have had to come together again sometimes. Between but now if and there was no here, backup, right? like if there was no plan, no backup, somebody didn't know how to do it, they would have to wait for me to feel better. And I stayed three days in the in the bed in the hotel in the town try to recover get my liquids yeah. back it was a bad day hmm. and your best day ever man too many best days you know i'm a lucky guy i pray a lot to god i think my family prays god a lot as well you know i'm a lucky person to be where i am in short period of time i think i i won't say one of my best days was uh december last year where I had my wife and my kids in Uberlandia, 85% of us. So we, we bring all the employees we can together, close to 100 employees. And of course, disaster recovery, operational emergency, we had to keep some key people out. It wasn't everybody, but it, it was some people out. But seeing 90% of my, my family together with the 90% of the, the people that I spend my daytime, you know, Juan Trillo, Marlon, Epaphras, everybody you can think of, you know, all the guys mm. singing, dancing, eating in the office, you know, opening up our new office. That was like, I said, I told myself, you know, I thank God for giving me opportunity, looking at the people and, uh, you know, I'm lucky because these guys follow me, believe me, they have families, they have kids, they have, uh, you know, parents that they are maintaining. They trust me. They go behind me to back me up as their leader in order for me to provide them. And I'm lucky. I felt like that was the best day of my life. Amazing. And it didn't help that the World Cup was on, probably. Oh, yeah. we. I have videos of World Cup. You know, you've probably seen some of those. That was amazing. You know, we were watching the World Cup all that. But I'm going to have a better day coming soon. End of the year, yeah. I gave myself a goal to meet in terms of the revenue target. And if I reach that revenue target, what I am going to do is that, you know, there was a big earthquake in Turkey. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there was a, the town that my family is from is okay. My mom is from, but my father is from, is like semi destroyed everything. So I will be reaching out to, to some friends as well as myself, raise some money to build a school. It's about 500 to $600,000 to build a school, but not just school, school and a dormitory because, mm. you know, schools crash, like, like, Everything crashed, like the whole cities, thousands, tens of thousands. I, they say 50,000 people died, but my sister was there volunteering. There's still people under the rubble there. It's bad. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be the day that when I do it, when I reach my quota this, this year, my, my, my goal, yeah. and go back and do this, this is going to be the happiest day of my professional life. Because thanks to Ejuno and customers like you, friends like you, I am able to achieve that. Awesome. I hope my best day is in front of me too. That's a, that's a, that's actually a good question. I can start asking people that. So that was your, that was your old best day. What's going to be your new best day? You said something in there. I, I, I did want to ask a question on. So as I mentioned early on, you, you're not a serial entrepreneur, worked for people before. 
you know, you, you described it as a blessing and an honor to be, to be, have people follow you. There's also a lot of pressure. It's a responsibility. Did you appreciate the responsibility? And, and I guess in, in really big companies, there is no that person. That's more of like a small company sort of thing, but there's a responsibility, you know, being the d decider, being the decision maker, being the, the, the person at the top of the food chain. Is that what you thought it would be like? I was expecting harder times. I think their luck, luck help us with, with, you know, COVID hitting and then the growth of the company, some partnerships, some of the things that I have achieved was achieved in extraordinary times, you know, uh, given the circumstances, I admit, but it's not about raising. It's not about growing the company from five to 150 in three years. It's about staying at 150 is the hardest part. Every day, you know, uh, I used to be, I used to go to vacation four or five times before when I worked somewhere because I had holidays. When I traveled somewhere to Singapore for a conference, I would be like, hey, I bring my wife and I will take them to Bali. Then next thing, hey, let's go to Tahiti this summer. Ask me four years, zero vacation. You know where I go with my wife and kids for vacation for Thanksgiving? To Berlandia. The other year, mm -hmm. Bogota, to spend time with the people. It changed your life. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it makes me a better person because now I understand when a customer comes and tells me, hey, I have financial problems. I can't pay you this month. Give me a little bit of time. I'm like, okay, man, I understand. I'm in the same boat. But I tell them, look, it's okay this month, but I want you to understand. I'm very short on my reserves. It's a lot of pressure, yeah. but pressure, I hope it doesn't break me. Yet. I got to be honest, you know, it's a, going through hard times. A lot of people are having problems in collection problems, bank problems. Seven mm -hmm. big customers we have, seven big customers. These are customers on a significant size. Six of them was using Silicon SVB. Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Like, whoa. Hey, you just stop. Everybody basically sending us notes saying, guys, like we, we are, we are going to change the bank. This is the new information. We need to validate, blah, blah. But it's like, who would have told of that? Who would have told this type yeah. of concept? So you sometimes worry about this. But at the end of the day, I am healthy. My family is healthy. That's my, my employees are healthy. Uh, everything is going to be all right. I, I am trying to worry less, but the pressure is hard and it's getting harder and harder. And I think that next six months is going to get only harder. And spending time with family, friends like you, family members, I think that's what's going to help us kind of calm down and everything is going to be all right. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a better note than that to leave it on. Mehmet, my friend, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will see you soon. I hope I will I... see you sooner than later somewhere. Yes. Yes. I look forward to seeing you, man. I miss you. It's been a long time since we hang out in Chicago. Hopefully, you know, our roads cross, but you know, worst case, I I will try to go to Chicago if I have to. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me over here. Thanks, Mehmet. Take care. This is different. Another round. So much more to talk about. Gonna aim to satisfy with the help from Cash Fly. Get to it, do it fast. Right here on the Anycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here on the Anycast. The Anycast Podcast. Brought to you by Cash Fly.